The time is 10 p.m. Eastern, 7 p.m. Pacific. On a Tuesday night, the place is wherever you hang your hat. And the show is Mission Log Live. I'm Ken Ray. And I'm John Champion. And each week on Mission Log Live, you are the star. You call us, you chime in with your questions or comments. And tonight, let's talk about toys. Star Trek toys, to be exact. If you've got Netflix, you may have heard about the excellent series they do called The Toys That Made Us. They've covered G.I. Joe, Barbie, that other sci-fi franchise as well. And they also did a recent episode about Star Trek, the good, the bad, and the... Huh? Tonight, we have Star Trek expert John Tenuto as featured in that show to give us the lowdown on those toys and so much more. And as always, we want your questions and your comments because remember, we are here for you. So you can click on that Zoom link to join our meeting or you can use the one tap from your smartphone. You can even call us the old fashioned way. Dial us at 646-558-8656 and enter the meeting code that you'll find in the show description and in the comments. Thank you to everybody who is joining us as this show happens on Facebook or YouTube. A special shout out to the names I caught as they were scrolling by. Oh, I see John. I see Carlos. I see Alan. I see Eugene. That's a brave, you know, I like that name. That's a, that's a cool name. Uh, so uh, thank you too to the people, by the way, who are catching this show uh, later on Facebook or YouTube as well. Now, maybe you can't watch live or maybe you're wondering, you know, as you're listening to this later, how you could have watched live. Well, you know, just come to Facebook or YouTube, 7 p.m. Pacific, 10 p.m. Eastern. If you want to catch this later, though, or if you missed part of it and want to catch it again, um, maybe you like to listen while you work. Maybe you're just an audio type person. We will have the audio of this show in its very own podcast feed. Just search for Mission Log Live wherever you get your podcasts or make it easy uh, there's one place to actually check out all of the Roddenberry podcasts. It is podcast.roddenberry.com. There you'll find links to all of our shows, including Mission Log Live, Mission Log, The Trek Files, Women at Warp, and Priority One, uh, with more shows uh, coming when they do. And we do have one last request, uh, because we are needy, needy people. Uh, wherever and whenever you're catching this, if you're watching it live right now, uh, please hit like, please hit share. And if you're watching it later, uh, please hit like and please hit share because um, that way more people can find out about this show and then we'll be talking to more people next week. Oh, hey, hey, Ken, speaking of sharing, I want to do something shameless right now. Will, will you <laughs> indulge me? Is that okay? Uh, will it lose us our PG rating? Ooh, boy, that would, but we might gain a whole new audience. No, That's what, what, I'm, what I'm thinking is uh, a shameless appeal for a giveaway. Okay. So check it out. We're talking about toys tonight, obviously. So what I have here is a toy that I love. I own one myself. This is an Art Asylum classic tricorder. It is really, really nice. And uh, we're going to give one away. And since you just mentioned sharing, I thought the way to give it away is that uh, we encourage people to share this video stream, whether they do it now or they do it through the week after it's been recorded and posted and stays on Facebook. And we will do a random drawing of a name of someone who shared the video link. So that's all you have to do. You share this page, you share this link, and you may very well win a classic tricorder from Art Asylum. Uh, so we're going to give you a week to do it between now and the next live show, which will be next Tuesday night, July, uh, sorry, June 12th. And uh, I may even just uh, read the name of the winner on the air. How's that? That sounds pretty cool. So we're going to meet our guest in just a moment. But if you have any toy stories that you want to share or questions about toys or just reminiscences, reminiscence, rememberings, let's say, about a toy that you had in the past or one that you're out there looking for now, uh, again, click the Zoom link or call 646-558-8656. That number again, 646-558-8656. Uh, we have a poll question for this week. And of course, uh, we want to talk about the poll question, not from last week, but from the week before, because last week, I guess if you're really that into it, you could have made up your own poll question. If you want to tell us what that was, <laughs> that's fine. Uh, the question we asked a couple of weeks ago, though, when our friend Vic Mignona was on the show, are fan films part of your Star Trek fandom? Are they things that, you know, help you keep the Star Trek alive in you? Um, more people not than so. 44% say yes, fan films are part of their Star Trek fandom. 56% uh, said that they 
uh, we're not. I'm wondering, well, I don't know. You tell me, John, what is our, what is our, what is our poll for this week? Uh, well, I, I'll tell you, we, we tried to make it just very straightforward, very simple. Spock helmet or Migo Gorn? And look, I, I'm not going to give that any context. I, I'm not going to say a hey, which would you rather, uh, uh, which one do you hate more, which one do you love more, which one do you want to go home with? I'm just saying Spock helmet or Migo Gorn, two of the weirdest early Star Trek toys. And there are a lot of weird ones, and we'll talk about those tonight. But, you know, the Spock helmet is the, the white helmet with the red siren on top, uh, and, and it just makes no sense. And then the Mego Gorn, which definitely looks nothing like the Gorn. Right now, the last time I checked, the Spock helmet had 48%. The Mego Gorn had 52%. I'm of two minds about this, Ken. As a Mego completist, I would want that Mego Gorn. But as somebody who appreciates all things that are weird and terrible, um, I kind of want that Spock helmet. <laughs> so yeah. you really have to be a certain kind of geek to know just how bad the Gorn is, right? And watching the Netflix documentary, it's actually kind of fascinating because even if you are that kind of geek, the probably the most most you're going to be able to say is, well, it doesn't look much like a Gorn. You literally, honestly, have no idea how many different toys went into making the Miko Gorn. It was kind of a <laughs> kind of a fascinating thing. That said, for me personally, I'd probably go for the helmet because you know I have a tendency to run into things, and that would also be functional mm. for me. Good, good. Yeah, safety is uh, definitely a priority there. By the way, uh, somebody just asked, are there pictures of the Spock helmet and the Miko Gorn? Yes, you can go see those pictures on our Facebook page on the poll question, and then you can choose for yourself. Spock helmet or Amigo Gorn. They're just, they're both so weirdly wonderful. I encourage you to check them out. But hey, let's not waste any more time. Let us invite our guest to join us. And then you, you, our listeners, will get to chime in and ask your own questions either in the chat or preferably by calling us or joining the Zoom meeting. So as I mentioned before, on Netflix, the toys that made us, their season two opener is dedicated to Star Trek. More than 50 years of toys are covered from the hits to the flops, and we invited a Trexpert from that very show to join us tonight. John Tenuto is a frequent contributor to StarTrek.com, TrekMovie.com, and TrekNews.net. And he's not just a writer and fan, though. He's got the academic cred, too. He is a professor of sociology, and he studies Star Trek fandom. In fact, he does a class called Introduction to Sociology, Star Trek Edition at the College of Lake County. Welcome to the show, John Tenuto. Hi, thank you for, thanks for inviting me. Thank you so much. And, and first of all, man, that's quite the collection behind you. How long did that take to put together? Uh, since I was a little kid, actually, this has been, um, I have no other vices except Star Trek toys. And, uh, so, uh, this has really been, uh, this is every Christmas present and every birthday present, uh, for the last, uh, 49 years. <laughs> wow. All right. So where were you an original series? Were you there for TOS, uh, when it, when it was first on? I was very young when TOS was on a little too young to enjoy it. Um, I, re I just really discovered Star Trek uh, in reruns in the 1970s. Gotcha. All right. Yes. And, and oh, go ahead, Ken. Well, I mean, I, I don't want to jump straight into um, all of the toys, but there was a when I see that collection behind you, and when you say it's every Christmas, every birthday, every everything, watching the Netflix documentary, Doug Drexler said that there were toys that he wouldn't buy because they were just silly. And I guess I have a question. If it said Star Trek on the outside, would you have it? Like uh, things like, like I'm thinking about like the little pinball machine with Star with Spock's face on it or things like that. I mean, if, I mean, if it said Star Trek, was it yours or did you have to stand back at any point and go, eh, it looks like not really a corn? Well, you know, a lot of, I think a lot of, a lot of fans, uh, uh, everybody approaches collecting differently. Some people have their niche and they, maybe they only collect uh, screen used props or they collect costumes or they collect only action figures. I'm a little bit of a, I like everything. I especially like the tchotchke. Um, I like mm -hmm. those kinds of things that are unique or maybe mass produced, but a little bit unusual. Like um, one of my favorite items is this, um, uh, the famous craft oh. uh, uh, marshmallow dispenser that you got for sending in your, your marshmallow uh, wrappers from uh, Star Trek five. 
And I, I, th those kinds of things are kind of, uh, to me, a lot of fun, and they represent what toys should be about, which is something to open, something to have fun with, uh, something to share with other people. So, yeah, if it has Star Trek on it, it's a pretty. I'm not. I'm not going to refuse it. It's like pizza. There's no such. <laughs> There's no such thing as a bad pizza. So there's some pizza that's better than others, but I'll always take a slice. Can, can I tell you no lie that 20 minutes before the show when Ken and I were chatting and we were talking about Star Trek toys, he asked about the marshmallow, sorry, marshmallow dispenser from Star Trek V. Yeah, that, that was what a hot topic. Yeah. What we couldn't remember was who it was that had put it out. So thank you very much to the good people at Craft because I saw that front <laughs> and center. Yeah. And, and they're, they're no dummies. I mean, sure, if you have that, you're, you're still thinking about Kraft marshmallows even today. <laughs> exactly. Well, that's interesting, John. I mean, I, I, I'm kind of of two minds about this because I, I, I've also been collecting for a long time. And I remember getting Star Trek toys as a kid. Uh, for birthdays or for Christmas or something like that. And, and there were the things that were obviously the cool toy that you wanted, like the Mego action figures or something like that. Um, but then there were the, the kind of the throwaway toys, the ephemera, that didn't really seem to have any collectible value. One of my favorite things that I picked up years later, because I was not born when it came out, was a little uh, handheld film winder that had a little strip of film from Star Trek. It was eight millimeter, and you would just sort of hold it up to your eye and turn the little knobs, and it would play a little scene from Star Trek. It was sold in a grocery store for like 69 cents, I'm sure, in about 1967, 1968. It's the kind of thing that would have been torn open, the package thrown away, and that toy long, long lost. Do you... It, do you find that there is a joy in that kind of stuff as opposed to like the, I feel like where we are now is the highly collectible, the things that are made to be collectors items. And that's a whole other realm of stuff. Yeah. What you're talking about is actually, ironically, I have that here too. Um, You've got one too. Yes. <laughs> oh, um, oh. So that is the, uh, that's the chem toy. That was from 1967. It was one of the very first, uh, collectibles, if you wanted to call it that, although you're exactly right, it wasn't designed to be a collectible. It was designed to be a usable toy. You, it's, it was called a rack toy. Uh, a lot of the early Star Trek collectibles were for companies like uh, Chemtoy or Azrak Hamway that were uh, impulse purchase, uh, or it really meant to be impulse purchases. Um, I, I love those kinds of products today from a sort of historical standpoint, because that was streaming before there was streaming. So that that was how we as fans enjoyed Star Trek in the 1970s, before there was VHS. Um, before, really, the only opportunity you had was either to catch a rerun, maybe record one on your, on your cassette tape in the mid-70s when cassette tapes became more popular, or um, to, do, to use those kinds of products like the chem toy, uh, a little... Um, projector in order to enjoy Star Trek in your home. So that's sort of the precursor to the VHS and then to the DVD and then to the streaming world. I had a question, uh, something else, and, and I'm going to be disappointed now if you don't hold up like a whole stack of these because the, the toys that John and I were talking about either beforehand or something that he'll just offhandedly mention. I'm wondering, uh, did your, uh, well, I don't know if it would have happened at the time or if it would have happened later. Did your interest in collectibles uh, span out to sort of the, well, I guess they did because you had like the Kraft Marshmallow thing, for example. John and I were trying to remember if Burger King did the Star Trek II, the Wrath of Khan glasses, or did anybody do those? I guess I'm wondering if you're, do you get more into the practical things as well? Like a drinking glass is not a toy, kids. It's just not, no matter how much you might want to play with one. Um, yeah, watches, things like that, things that are actually utilitarian as opposed to being a toy. But did those things interest you? And, and can you talk a bit about that, sort of that subgenre, I guess? Absolutely. In fact, my wife and I, who, my wife also does the research with me, we call those collect edibles. Uh, the, the collectibles that are, especially for the, from the world of sort of the food premium side of things, uh, mm -hmm. they're both functional and, and, and cool and also a challenge to collect. So, uh, yes, I, I, when I, when Star Trek three came out, uh, I rode my bike every week to Taco Bell to get one of the Star Trek three glasses. In fact, the, the glasses spoiled the movie. 
if you didn't uh, see the film yet, one of the glasses shows you that the Enterprise is destroyed and another one shows you that Spock is resurrected. So th those glasses would be out now uh, in today's world where we, we don't even get a movie novelization now until six months after a film is out because uh, they want to keep secrets and preserve secrets in the world of the Internet. But back then in 1984, it was a little bit different. But uh, yeah, you know, Star Trek II didn't get any glasses, but Star Trek III did. Um, Star Trek II didn't get a whole lot of anything. Um, there, were, there was some um, metal um, uh, pewter uh, game pieces that you guess kind of substituted for action figures, if in action figures is really what they were. You know, there were some pendants. There was a soundtrack. Uh, my wife and I have done a lot of research on Wrath of Khan through Nicholas Meyer's uh, collections. And uh, there are memos in there about uh, debates about the book. And uh, should they release the book without the last chapter? And then people can go back to the bookstore and get the, the last chapter after the movie comes out. Uh, but there really wasn't a lot of wow. product for Wrath of Khan because it's part of that, that, that hit and miss cycle of Star Trek where the films that, that were popular at the box office didn't generate a lot of collectibles because the film that preceded it, which might not have been as popular at the box office, did generate a lot of, uh, of and the sales weren't there for those toys or collectibles. And therefore, uh, retailers and licensees were a little bit uh, nervous about coming on, believe it or not, to Star Trek II. There really wasn't a lot because uh, all of the tremendous product that was released for motion picture did not do very well uh, in, in retail. And that was continues through Star Trek. Was that the first one I remember, but the thing is I was nine. So I'm just sort of starting to wake up to things, you know, happening in the world about that age. Um, I do remember I had the, the uh, Star Trek Happy Meal and I had the little premium, the wrist communicator thing, I think it was, that was the, the toy in that. When did those start? <laughs> not not for Star Trek specifically, but uh, I like I like your term, so I'm going to steal it. The collect edibles. When did when did that kind of thing begin? Was it right around that same time? Well, there had been you know there were some Dr Pepper Star Trek glasses that you could get at um, franchise places in the in 1976, that kind of thing. But in terms of Star Trek, really, it hitting the ground was Star Trek the motion picture. In fact, the first ever Happy Meal, Happy Meals premiere in June of 1979. And then six months later is the very first Happy Meal that's ever paired to a movie. And that is Star Trek, the motion picture. So if anybody's uh, bored, you could check out on YouTube. You can see the commercial uh, from, uh, from McDonald's where you have a Klingon in Klingon explaining to you what a Happy Meal is. Because at that time, it was still a new product. And kids didn't know that they got a cookie and a treat and a toy. Um, really, Star Trek, the motion picture... Uh, even in a way that's, you know, because Star Wars, Star Wars needed a year for the, lic the licensees to catch up with the popularity of the film. The film comes out in May of 1977. You don't get toys until uh, April, March and April of 1978 in terms of things like action figures. All you really get before that are puzzles, board games, and, and, and uh, label swaps from $6 million man toys that they slap Star Wars stickers on. But Star Trek The Motion Picture is pre-sold in terms of licensing. So you get a, a tremendously diverse amount of products for Star Trek The Motion Picture from Mego action figures to collect edibles uh, like the Happy Meals and, and uh, glasses and things like that. And that really was for Star Trek the first time that we see that. Although if you go back all the way to the 1960s, you do have Kellogg's giving us a Star Trek box during the, uh, you know, there was, a, there was a Kellogg's Spock Star, uh, Star Trek uh, 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 cereal box in the, while the show was on the air in 1967. Sugar Smacks it was back then. It was called Sugar Smacks. I, you know, I, I do still have a, a decent number of motion picture toys that I kind of accumulated at the time and, and, and over the years. But the one thing I never got that I, I, would, I would go to great lengths for, I would, uh, I would sell Ken, Maybe uh, for a Mego bridge from the motion picture. 
Uh, I know it was not nearly as cool as the one from TOS, uh, the big vinyl one with the transporter, but I, I love the fact that they made that sleek white bridge from the motion picture for the three and three quarter inch uh, action figures. By the way, it's really cool to see people chiming in. Earl Green actually mentioned those Happy Meals, people talking about Power Records. I remember those so well. Uh, people mentioning the um, the Star Trek three action figures. Uh, those are the ones put out by Ertl, I think. Uh, but we do have a caller on the line with a comment. We do have Will, I believe, waiting patiently. Are you there, Will? I am, John. How, how are you tonight? Very good. Thanks for calling in. And uh, you have a comment or a question here for Mr. Tenuto. I do, and I don't even know where to begin. So I'm gonna, I guess I'm gonna begin with what is directly behind him, because you know that I built a website called The History of Star Trek, the original series, a consumer home video, and that was based upon your po Mission Log podcast and in support of it. And behind John, he has the original uh, VHS display that was sold in the store uh, it was a pdq that was uh put into the retail stores that held all those vhs tapes and i have only seen one in a picture i've never seen anybody actually own one so uh i was just blown away when i saw that sitting behind you john um the uh that is a first. Uh, <laughs> and well, actually, wait, could, can we can we cut to John uh, really quickly here and just show out of the way? Um, there, so see it. Yeah. So those of you who are listening to the audio only version, go back and check out the video version because they can <laughs> play behind John. I'm to sorry. Show <laughs> yeah. Nice. Uh, nice. Uh, there it is. Yes. Yes. Fantastic. Uh, so that's my jig. But when it, when it comes to the Star Trek toys, I guess, like every other kid that got into Star Trek toys, I was first uh, involved with the Star Wars franchise and the Star Wars toys. And when it came to, and this supplemental probably would have been great if we were doing this when you guys were covering the animated series, because uh, I put a lot of links and images into your mission log website that were related to the Miko toys. I think you remember, John, we discussed a lot of that stuff at the oh, time. Yeah. Because yeah. It was, in my mind, the Miko toy line is associated with my experience with the animated series. They were kind of inseparable in my mind. The Miko toy line was the animated series toys. And I know that wasn't the intent, but that's just kind of the way that merchandise came out after the animated series and before going into the motion picture and you discussed owning the film. Well, to me, the coolest film piece uh, that was ever released were the, Oh gosh, the Viewmaster viewfinders, uh, two Star Trek episodes, uh, the Omega glory and Mr. Spock's time Trek is what they call the other one. And it was the animated series but it was uh, yesteryear. They had renamed it for the Viewmaster version. Uh, and what was so phenomenal about that was that was the first time I had ever kind of witnessed a Star Trek, uh, albeit animated, and or a TOS episode, the eight stills or seven stills. I think there were seven stills. Somebody will correct me out there. Um, in 3D. Uh, and so that whole error I associate with the animated series and I, I just, I, I wanted to call in cause I saw that display and I, I wanted to let the listeners know if they, uh, I, I posted some really cool information about those Miko toys, uh, on mission logs website, uh, in the uh, archives in association with the animated series. And, uh, thanks for having me on guys. And, uh, John, pleasure listening to you. Uh, thank, thank you. Well, thank you very much for, uh, thank you very much for calling in. I want to remind everybody else too, if you want to call in, if you have a, a particular remembrance or a toy that you want to ask about, or just 
a question that you'd like to ask John. Uh, the Click on the Zoom link, as we always say, or you can give us a call, 646-558-8656. That number again is 646-558-8656. I'm, I'm embarrassed to say I, there are toys that I want to ask about, but the problem is all of my Star Trek stuff got swallowed up by Star Wars. And sort of I was saying, like, I remember when I got that first Happy Meal when I was nine. I remember when I got my first Star Wars toys when I was eight. There's been this thing that I seem to remember. It was some sort of projector, and you had kind of a cardboard, um, like a film strip, except it wasn't a film strip because I guess they didn't want kids to tear it. But you could actually, kind of like the Viewmaster, except you could project it on a wall or things like that. But the problem that I have is I just have these little snatches of memory of things that I might have had. Like I'm pretty sure I had a Captain Kirk shirt at one point. And I know I had the Mego thing because there was not yet any Star Wars stuff to sell to people. And so my grandparents bought me the bridge set, which, you know, sadly, I was telling a friend earlier, is, is probably in the landfill someplace, which breaks my heart. I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> well, I got a couple things. Uh, one is uh, this is for John. I show you this, John. There you Wait. go. <gasps> oh, 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 can I can I come over and play later? Yeah, is that, sure. uh, yeah okay. <laughs> um, oh, wait, two, wait. I'm sorry for people who can't see on the audio. Can you guys describe what that is exactly? That this is what uh, John was talking about. This is the Mego uh, bridge playset from Star Trek: The Motion Picture, which. Uh, was the resize when when Mego got the uh, when Mego decided to make toys for the motion picture, they went in the direction of the Star Wars line. It's one of the ways that the two franchises have always sort of influenced each other. Um, going back to you know Richard Edlund, who did the special effects for Star Wars, did the effects for Star Trek back in the '60s on TV. Uh, so there, there's always been this kind of connection between the two, and one of them is the obviously the the Kenner success of the Kenner Star Wars line uh, really inspired shrinking Star Trek sized fi- you know figures down to Star Wars sized figures and and so on um, the other thing I want to mention too about the viewmaster uh, what, what you're thinking of is there was a view there were two kinds of viewmasters uh, that were available to us back then one was the the handheld viewmaster where you would just click on that and another one was the um, the, the literally like a like a home projection unit. So it was something where you'd get strips of film and you could put it in and then you could show it on the, the wall, that kind of thing. Um, and they did have a Star Trek version of that as well as, uh, uh, you know, other franchises as, you know, Disney and things like that. But what's really interesting about the Viewmaster set from 1968, um, Viewmaster required back then, not today they could do it using computers, but back then, they needed to be. They needed to take their own pictures. So, if anybody has the 1968 Omega Glory Viewmaster set, those are not stills from the episode. Those are set photography. Those are images that Viewmaster took while the episode was being made of them working on the episode. Which is why you get a couple of images that are not in the episode in that Viewmaster set. You, in fact, one of them is of Nichelle Nichols, kind of in between moments, looking at her script, that kind of thing. And that's included in the set. Um, Hmm. And of course, the cover of that, they had to do their own cover. So when you see the two spaceships on the cover, the two starships, that was done, those were done using the Star Trek models, but done by and photographed by Viewmaster. So that's a really unique set and a nice little piece of Star Trek history, the, the Viewmaster reels to look at those images. Very cool. Hey, I, I want to come back and talk about a uh, little more of that Mego 70s period, a, a just purely selfishly because it's near and dear to my heart. And uh, there are a lot of those pieces that I still have and some of those pieces that that got away. So I'd like to cover some more of that when we come back. But we do have a little bit of business to talk about. I do want to remind people, first of all, about the giveaway that we're doing. There it is. It's the Art Asylum Classic Tricorder. It is so nice, and all you have to do potentially win it is just share this link from Facebook to this video stream, and then we will pick a winner next week and announce that winner on next week's show. So make sure you do that. You have a whole week to do it, so even if you're not catching us live, that gives you your opportunity. But as long as we're talking about um, awesome Star Trek collectibles, Ken, how about we talk about our own collectibles? 
I think you know what I mean. I think we should. And I think we should actually ask John if he has all of them when we come back. <laughs> <laughs> Although... Yeah, that might be expecting a bit. Yeah, so we have a shop at the uh, at the Mission Log website, missionlogpodcast.com. And you go up to the top and you click the word shop and all of a sudden you're shopping away. Uh, our friend Carl, Carl Huber, uh, still cranking out a ton of stuff. There are a couple of designs that are being worked on right now. Um, yeah, a bunch of designs there, like uh, some new stuff that Carl has done, like the Isolinear Ken and John, which is pretty cool. Uh, Carbon Chauvinism gets a reboot because, you know, it is Star Trek associated. So for goodness sake, please get to rebooting, won't you? And, uh, and Lieutenant Junior J, by the way, hello, Tracy. I saw you were in the, uh, in the chat room earlier. Hey, Tracy, um, what up? Lieutenant J, or I guess it's just J, because just it is J. that, you know, it's that simple, it's that elegant, it's that renowned. Just mm-hmm. Jay. Um, that's a fantastic shirt, which I, uh, I like my Lieutenant Jay shirt a lot. Mm-hmm. What are some of the other shirts we have available, or other designs, I should say, that we have available, John? Oh, man, uh, bonk, bonk on the head since 1966. That's the classic you see Timmy moment that we love to point out, particularly in TOS. You have the, the tribute to the late, great Nova Squadron. Uh, you have that classic Ditalix Mining Corporation. Some of the old favorites like Cool as Kirk and uh, one of my favorites, Ethos, Pathos, Logos. And I just want to mention that next week, so that would be June 12th, along with uh, announcing the winner of that tricorder, got some new designs I'm putting up. So uh, Carl's been hard at work and I have some classic stuff and, and kind of an exclusive that I'll be putting up. So starting on Tuesday, June 12th, new stuff in the Mission Log shop. And again, how do you get there? You go to missionlogpodcast.com. And all those designs, not just for t-shirts, you got mugs, you got stickers, you got notebooks, even tapestries, notoriously tapestries. So tons of stuff to check out and make your own truly unique Trek-ish gear. So get yours today at missionlogpodcast.com. Hey, don't forget, if you would like to ask a question or submit a comment, I make it sound so formal. If you've got something to say, just come on and say it. Uh, click the Zoom meeting link. Uh, you can uh, use the one-tap form from your smartphone or the one-tap button from your smartphone. And, of course, you can call us, 646-558-8656, 646-558-8656. Enter the meeting code that you'll find in the show description and in the comments. And then you'll be talking toys uh, just like we're doing now. Hey, John, uh, when we heard from Will a moment ago, he mentioned something about those Mego action figures coming out. I think they started in 73, the first wave, uh, and then they carried on 74, 75. Maybe they started in 74, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but he said something about them being, in his head, indelibly tied to the animated series. And I always thought that too, there was something really clever about the design and marketing of those toys that somehow fit seamlessly with Star Trek being in syndication, literally, you know, since the day it ended in 1969, since TOS ended in 69, and then that first rebirth with the animated series in 73. And those Mago figures and the, uh, the bridge and all the other ancillary stuff that came out around that time really seem to have a foot in both worlds, both Trek on screen in the original series and the animated series. Do you think that was by design? Do you think it's just because that's what we had at the time? Have you given any thought to that yourself? Oh, sure. I mean, the bridge playset is a great example of uh, the influence of the animated show, particularly on uh, on Mego. Uh, other things, of course, are more directly from the show. The Mission to Gamma 6 playset is based on the Apple. Um, but the Enterprise Bridge playset, which is really, I think, the heart of that collection, uh, in addition to the action figures from the 70s, um, is so colorful. Um, and and just that, col- that, that imagery of it makes you think of the animated show. The the two people that are really responsible for a lot of what you see with Mego is a man by the name of John McNett. He's the one who actually designed the transporter toy where you spin the figure and you press the button and they disappear. Um, and then you had Harold Schull who designed not only the incredible packaging, which I thought was fantastic. I mean, Mego's packaging is really some of the best uh, toy packaging in, in all of toy history. 
Um, and also Harold Schull designed some of the, the toys themselves. And they really brought a lot of creativity. When you look at the Mego line, there's so much there that's innovative and creative. Um, I'm thinking of the telescreen console, which was, oh. you know, light speed ahead of any other toy that went in a way that was on the market you, you put captain kirk in the in in, in uh, uh you put your action for your captain kirk action figure in a little captain kirk chair and then you interact with and you have sort of a phaser battle and it was very sophisticated for a toy coming out in 1976. i'm uh, so glad you mentioned that i actually had that toy i i never got the mission to gamma six but I remember having the telescreen console and sitting my Kirk action figure in it. And I hate to think what I did to it over the years. I, I'm pretty sure that it ended up in pieces somehow, but it was a really cool toy. Yeah. And, and I think so. They, they really did a great job of, of appealing to fans of the original live action and to the kids who are getting into Star Trek because of the animated show, both with their innovation and also with their design aesthetics. So they, they, and that is one of the reasons they were so successful. Um, and also when you think about it, their other big lines were, a lot of them were from animated uh, properties too. So you had uh, Marvel and DC toys and so on. And, and this, you know, the, the justice, the, just, uh, the justice league, those kinds of toys. And those were, those were based either on comic books or on animated shows. So they were, they were in that vibe at the time anyway. We had a question uh, actually over in our Facebook chat. Uh, uh, today in Star Trek history, wants to know uh, if you have any recent Trek toys, like, you know, the Funko Pop uh, things. I think, and I was actually going to ask that as well, if you're still collecting, because when you panned over earlier, I'm pretty sure I saw Chris Pine's face in there. So I'm guessing you're still collecting, but um, are you keeping up with new stuff? And I guess my follow-up to that would be what's out there right now that really impresses you. Well, you know, the yes, uh, definitely still keeping up. I love the Funko Pops, for example. I have a whole sort of bobblehead and Funko Pop section uh, in the collection for sure. Um, yeah, I, I action figures. I those I always pursue those. So, um, and I'm very excited about what's hopefully coming out from McFarland Toys very soon. We're going to be getting a Captain Kirk and a card action figure and also uh, figures from the new TV show uh, Star Trek Discovery. And of course, his sculpts from that toy company are fantastic. And also, you know, Diamond Select Toys has really been, um, uh, both when they were Art Asylum and then when they, when they merged together and became Diamonds and Time and Select Toys and Art Asylum became the same company. You know, they've been doing the Star Trek license uh, for almost 15, 16 years now. And they've produced over 150 action figures and uh, a, a great variety of figures. And they continue to make um, action figures and ships. And so there is a lot of great uh, product out there. I know Ego Moss, of course, makes uh, fantastic ship models for, for fans. That, and, and one of the great things about Star Trek toys, period, is you have different price points. So you can come in at a, at a, you know, a, a $20 model, or you can go for a $2,000 uh, starship um, from, you know, QMX. It just depends on what you enjoy, what you can afford, and what you're interested in. And uh, that's true of Funko Pops all the way up to statues that are a couple hundred dollars. So I actually, one sorry, of my Ken. favorite, really, no, I'm, I'm sorry, John, really quickly. That's one of my favorite things, honestly, is I have two phasers. Uh, one is uh, Captain Pike's phaser from the cage, and the other one is uh, handheld from, uh, from uh, TNG. Uh, the handheld from TNG, I picked up at a comic book, uh, at like a, a Comic Con, a, a much uh, a second tier city Comic Con. But the guy had been carrying it from show to show to show for years, and he was just like, "I, I will give you these three other things if you will just give me five dollars for that." <laughs> and then the, the Captain Pike phaser. I mean, part of me wanted to leave it in the box because it had never been opened. But then I'm like, "But then I won't be able to be Captain Pike." So I mean, yes, I like the fact that I was able to get something that's. It's decent looking. It was the Playmates, I think, is the one that made this particular phaser. Um, it's decent looking enough that I can feel like I'm doing something, but I'm not afraid to handle it. Not afraid to take it out of the package and, you know, dive behind a rock and, and <laughs> jump over and pretend to shoot somebody because that's always fun. I'm sorry, John, you were saying. Oh, no, a couple of things. Uh, Rick Carter in the chat says, I have 81 Eagle Moss ships so far. And Ken, I wish, I, I feel like we, we need a bell to ring 
or something. Like I, I feel partly responsible for that. So uh, good job, Rick. But somebody else said that one of the first models they ever built was a Type Two phaser. Now. I know that uh, obviously ever since Star Trek went on the air, fans, and uh, you know we've talked to Doug Draxler before, fans were really responsible a lot for building their own props, their own products, because there is a sort of very quiet period <laughs> where there weren't a lot of cool collectible toys. We had the Mego stuff in the 70s, but there might've been something missing. But for those who really wanted a prop, I have to show this off. The, this is one of the original pressings of the AMT exploration set. Um, I, this was actually a gift to me from one of our listeners, from uh, actually Meredith, our number one uh, listener, Ken. Uh, so th this, I think, cemented her position as number one mission log listener. But this thing was so cool, partly because it was so terrible. Um, for those of us who, who knew and loved and watched TOS uh, religiously and all we wanted, I mean, as a nine-year-old, like, oh, just give me a screen accurate prop. Well, no, you got this. And it was the uh, super deformed version of all of these props. But uh, I, now this one I'll never open. But I remember seeing online somewhere that a, a prop builder had built this kit as if they were building it to accurate colors and, and an accurate paint job. And it just still looks crazy. It just still looks nuts. So yeah, that's just a weird collectible I had to show off. One other thing I wanted to show really quickly, and, and John, this will uh, uh, segue into the next question for you. Somebody asks about the rarest Playmates figure, but I wanna show off something really, really quickly before we get to that about one of the rarest figures you can have because you can't have it. Um, this is a prototype of the Gene Roddenberry action figure from Palisades Toys. And they, they made a handful of these prototypes to show off. Then they actually made some packaged versions with the full paint job. We have one here at the office, uh, but they never made it to market. And the whole idea was that you would have Gene and then you would have the captain's chair and Gene would stand behind the captain's chair kind of with his, with his hand resting there, and he would have Kirk in the chair in front of him. It's a really nice little set. I think they were making it for the 40th anniversary, somewhere around there. But yeah, uh, there's an article online about how they never got around to finishing the set. It never got to market. Uh, but I think it's really cool that there's one here that, that we get to show off a little bit. So there he is. Uh, so John, Tell us about the rarest of the Playmates. Well, Playmates was uh, a fantastic line. In fact, there is no company that has made more Star Trek uh, action figures than Playmates. Playmates had the license from 1992 until 1999. And then again, they had it for the uh, 2009 movie. Um, they made an amazing array of figures. Uh, for many people, it is their favorite uh, Star Trek action figure line. They made 367 uh, four-inch figures, th uh, 31 six-inch figures, 89 nine-inch figures, and 31 12-inch figures. In addition to play sets and role-playing toys and ships and phasers and everything else, an amazing diverse line and uh, very, very popular. In fact, they were selling at one time 100,000 uh, of each figure to collectors and they were all numbered on the bottom um, they, they not only gave you, uh, one of the criticisms, if there is one about the Kenner line, uh, or the Hasbro line of star Wars toys is that you do get Luke, you know, in the same outfit 20 times mm -hmm. and there might be tweaks in the line. They might make the, make, make Luke a little bit, look a little bit better in one, you know, sculpting than another, but playmates never did that. If you got captain Kirk, you got captain Kirk. If they released the second captain Kirk, it was in a completely different outfit. And so they gave you a diversity of the main characters, but they also gave you a diversity of characters like Trelane or like the swarm alien from Voyager. And they would do figures who were in, you know, w w one episode, which was just really great because that appealed to collectors and as well as kids. Um, unfortunately, um, they decided to make um, a line of exclusive action figures that were limited to 1,701 only. 
So there were going to be three figures. One was a Captain Kirk, uh, Captain Picard. One was a Tasha Yar. And one was a Barkley action figure. And there were only going to be 1,701 of those made. And they were going to, um, you know, you, we position that against 100,000 units of other figures. There's a lot of collectors and kids who are going to be disappointed. And that's what happened. Um, so some of the rarest figures are also some of the figures that did, that in a way did in, there are, there are many reasons why the line ended, but one of them was because once you take the inability, once people can't be completists, you take away something from a lot of collectors because a lot of collectors are completists. And if only 1,701 people can have that figure, if I can't have them all, I may not bother collecting any of them. That, that, that is part of why Playmate sent it. So those are kind of the famous rare ones, but there's also a rare figure. Um, there's a couple other rare ones that are interesting, but one of them is a, what's called a mail away Cisco. There were only 4,000 of those made and they were uh, Captain Cisco and he was in, um, it was from a video game. So you, you got him, you had to get the video game in order to send in for that figure. Uh, and in fact, I have him uh, behind me and on the shelf there, you'll see him maybe. Um, and, uh, but that was also a rare figure. Uh, there was also a seven of nine and a, and a crusher that was only released in the UK uh, in different outfits. So there, there's a couple of really interesting rare ones. Perhaps the rarest, though, is something called a trifold Borg, which was really only given in the industry. It wasn't available to fans to buy, uh, but it was a Borg on a card that folded out three times uh, as a promotional item. And that's really hard to get your hands on because you couldn't buy that one. Interesting. I'm... This is a question I feel like we should have asked um, more towards the beginning, but as I'm sitting here and getting really fascinated by the toys themselves, we talked about when you discovered Star Trek. We talked about how you discovered Star Trek. Uh, how does this go from that's a cool thing that's on in the afternoon to that back wall? What is it about Star Trek that speaks to you to the point that, that th this is a large part of what you do in your downtime? Well, you know, it's funny because Star Trek's uh, a lot of also really my a lot of my life is dedicated to Star Trek professionally. Um, my family time, my wife and my son uh, love Star Trek. Our, our son loves Star Trek. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think w whether it's sports or or a hobby like Star, like Star Trek, um, a lot of it has to do with how you were brought into it and who brought you into it. So I remember, you know, liking Star Trek in the 70s and watching it. But when I really became, I mean, in a way, who I am today with, with my relationship with Star Trek, that was uh, when uh, I was going away for the summer. It was 1982. Um, I was uh, getting ready to, you know, I was in high school. My parents thought I would benefit from going to California for about a month or two and stay with my brother Jim out there um, and just experience something a little bit different than staying in Chicago all the time. And uh, so my parents said, well, pick something to do and we'll do it with you before you go. And I said to my dad, well, let's go see it. There's a new Star Trek film out. Let's go see it. Well, I just happened to pick the opening night. I didn't know it was opening night, but it was opening night of Star Trek II. And I went to the Esquire Theater with my dad. And I had never had an experience like that at the movies before then. Uh, the energy, the fans, the conversation. I discovered that there was a fan community in addition to there being this amazing film. So now Wrath of Khan, of course, holds a very special place in my heart because my dad has been gone now about five years. And um, when I got to take our own son to see Star Trek II at the movie theaters last year when they re-released it for the day, that was a homecoming in a way. That was my dad. You know, I almost bought an empty seat for my dad next to me just to have him uh, with us. Um, so that a, a lot of it is sort of the family connection. It's the it's the the connection of um, of 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 uh, the times that I have, the memories that I have. And that's really what toys represent to me. The toys are about good times. I call them the wedding rings of fandom because, you know, my wedding ring symbolize, it's a physical symbol of my, um, uh, something emotional or ephemeral. And I think that's what toys are. That's what collectibles are. Collectibles allow us to touch something that isn't otherwise touchable. It's kind of like in a first contact when Picard and, and Data touch the phoenix. You know, touching something makes it real. And that's why everything important in life that's symbolic gets a physical representation, whether it's in religion or in marriage. Um, 
And that's true in fandom too. So for the baseball fan, it's owning a baseball, it's owning a, a jersey, it's owning baseball cards. For Star Trek fans, uh, it's owning maybe a little piece of the show through a prop or owning a toy. And uh, so for me, this is all about memories um, uh, and, and my connections uh, with my family. It's honestly, it's, it's your story of Star Trek II and my story of Star Trek II are, are similar. That was the first time I realized that I was missing something. And I had seen Star Trek on TV and I, you know, I'd, I'd, like I said earlier, I'd gone to see the motion picture, but I also just happened to be on opening night for Star Trek two. And I, cause my aunt took me, she was like, Hey, come on, we're going to go see a movie. And, and people laughed their head off when Savick said to Spock, you lied. And he said, I exaggerated. And the, and the, the theater went nuts and I didn't know why. And that was sort of like, that was sort of my first indication. That's like, okay, I think I know what's going on here, but I really don't know what's going on here. It's, um, it's interesting to hear somebody else be as emotional about that movie, actually. Hey, uh, you know, John didn't tell you about the lightning round. I'm just going to guess John didn't tell you about oh, the lightning oh, round. Oh, wait. I, oh, see, I, you know, I do all the de- guest coordination, and I, I just, I know I'm supposed <laughs> right. to talk about the lightning round, Ken, but I right. didn't yeah. mind yeah. this time, so... <laughs> Uh, yeah. John, there's no real lightning involved, but we would actually love to have you be part of the lightning round in just a moment. There's one thing I have to do first, though, and that is remind people of what I would love for them to do after this show. Um, after our show, please stay on Facebook and catch the live recording of Priority One, a Roddenberry Star Trek podcast. Each Tuesday at 11.30 Eastern, 8.30 Pacific, Elijah, Kenna, Anthony... And Winters bring you news from all over the Star Trek multiverse. It's it's TV and movie news. It's gaming news. It's literary reviews. It's all kinds of fun stuff. Uh, they kick off a few minutes after our show. So, you know, absorb all of this uh, toy talk, all of this Star Trek talk, and then settle in for even more Star Trek talk. Uh, Facebook.com slash Priority One Podcast is uh, where you go to watch them do that live. Or you can download the show as a podcast. Uh, tonight's edition will actually be edited and available on Friday. Or, of course, you can do both. Watch it live and then download it later. Because there are some things that they don't do live. Some things that are added in later that you might find interesting as well. So, all of those things. By the way, John, new guy on Priority One. I know you probably thought I was just being fancy saying that Tony was Anthony. Oh. Yeah, no, they yeah. have a new guy named Anthony who uh, I was his premiere episode i believe was last week and uh it was interesting it was interesting to hear uh, somebody new thrown into the mix so um oh. so that's something else for people to listen for if they want to listen changing it up a little yeah you trying yes. to say about about our format here or uh hey john i, I <laughs> <laughs> you are familiar with the idea of a lightning round because you know you live in the west you've watched tv a time or two um, just in case you don't know, uh, the lightning round, of course, is we throw comments or questions at you. You fire back as quickly as you can. Are you game to play, sir? All, all set. Fantastic. Uh, let's start with uh, what's a fairly easy one for a lot of people. Favorite uh, Star Trek series? Uh, original Star Trek. Okay. And so I guess that tells me the answer to the next question. But who's your captain? Uh, it's Captain Kirk. Okay. And your favorite bad guy in Star Trek? Without a doubt, Khan. Nice. All right. So uh, favorite starship? Oh, Voyager. Oh, oh, interesting choice. Okay. Now, if you could be any race in Star Trek besides human, what would you be? Uh, Vulcan, because I'd love to be able to control my emotions. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, very important question. Migo or Playmates? Ooh. Playmates. Okay, interesting answer. Uh, what piece of Star Trek technology would you like to have at home? Shields. Oh, wow. You live in a dangerous area then? Is that, uh, is that what you're saying? Okay. <laughs> in case my neighbors get angry at me. <laughs> okay, very good. And we need to come up with a new last question. It's not that I don't care. I will ask you, John, because I am curious, although... Yeah. We had said we were going to ask this question. Have you ever been to Vulcan, Alberta, Canada? Yes, my wife and I were actually invited up there to speak to uh, the community 
uh, in 2016, we, we, did, we talked about our Rathacon research uh, that we did, uh, and uh, we gave a great presentation. We showed some, we have about 800 images of Rathacon that have never been seen before from the making of the film. Uh, oh, wow. Show some of those. And Nicholas Meyer has been very wonderful and cooperative with us and helping us do our research. We, we do a lot of research with that, trying to celebrate we, we want the credits to come alive for people so that they know who Gain Reshner was and who Joe Jennings was and who all the people who made that movie were so we spend a lot of time um, going through and doing um, uh, talks and presentations about the people who made Star Trek 2 so that was a great a great town a wonderful place of Vulcan Alberta can you know I'm beginning to think John the real problem is just that we were asking the wrong people yeah maybe Maybe that was it. Yeah. <laughs> but, but but the idea was solid. So yeah, well the, the idea yeah. was fine, and it seemed like it yeah. seemed like an absolute uh, an absolute no brainer because I can't tell you, uh, Mr. Tenuto, how many times the answer was no. In fact, uh, Doug Drexler, I don't want to embarrass him again. Doug Drexler, Doug Drexler was surprised by the question. Yeah. I'll, I'll put it that way. <laughs> that might be the yeah. nicest way to say that. Yeah. I'm so curious. I, I, is Go there ahead. a is there well I, I apologize is there a is there a white whale out there is there one that has eluded you is there uh, well to put it in con terms is there is there a toy that tasks you or <laughs> or have, is there nothing out there that you have have yet to put your hands on oh no there is uh, I do I still do not have the um, trifold Borg um, and but I but really the one that I would love to have is one of the seventeen oh one Picards I do not have one of those I have. Uh, some of the other 1701s, but I don't have Picard. And uh, who who doesn't want a 1701 Picard? That's a great that's a great figure to have. Who doesn't? Who indeed doesn't? Um, oh, uh, uh, Cable here in the chat says, "Have you been to Trek Fest in Riverside, Iowa?" So I don't know, Ken. That that might sway what happens in the lightning round in the future. Um, uh, yes, you been? yes, you been? Oh, and. Okay. And uh, get to announce, uh, we're going to be there uh, this year. We're, my wife and I are the guests of honor at the Trek Fest this year. Uh, we are giving our presentation about Leonard Nimoy and his life. Uh, special thanks to Leonard Nimoy's family for uh, some of the resources that we get to share. Uh, and also we're doing our Wrath of Khan talk there as well. So uh, yes, at the end of June, we're going to be there. Sorry, June, it is the end of June. Uh, we're going to be in uh, Iowa giving uh, presentations, and I hope everybody who's out there can come and see what we're going to talk about. I don't think anybody's going to be able to rival what you've got behind you, or you know, certainly if they haven't spent a lifetime collecting, they're not going to be able to. But uh, one thing I'm curious about, if somebody is looking for something interesting, maybe not the most valuable, but something interesting, is your suggestion go to every convention you can, or is your suggestion stop by that yard sale that looks like it has nothing? Well, I think yard sales are really great uh, places because uh, that's where you're truly going to be surprised. You know, I, I mean, the great thing about something like eBay is you can usually get what you want as long as you have the money. You know, the problem mm -hmm. is there's no experience. There's no memory associated with it. Um, nearly every toy or item that I have has a story behind it, a person who gave it to me or an adventure when we went out and got it or like the videotapes. I got this at uh, a Star Trek convention um, at an auction. And so uh, I, I always rather would go for having an experience. And I think uh, yard sales are a great way to go. Although, you know, the nice thing about conventions are when you go to the dealer's room, you're never quite sure what you're going to find there either. So, um, but uh, certainly I would, I would say go to estate sales or, um, uh, you know, try to find things like that. And you'll sometimes you'll find comic books or action figures in your, your or even comic book stores will, have I found a lot of the Galoob action figures for a dollar once at a comic store about five years ago. I was able to buy a whole extra set of them. Man, I, I feel like there was so much stuff that we didn't get to in this episode. Uh, we didn't get to talk about Star Trek toys actually used in the production of Star Trek. That, that's a whole other angle to go down. But I, I really want to thank you for coming on. And, and uh, I feel like we can carry on this conversation at another time as well and and have you come on our show and talk about your sociology work as well because i love that you have a star trek angle as an entry point into the study of sociology so uh, i hope you'll come back and join us again sometime when the timing works out for us well thanks thanks for having me and thanks everyone for uh, for watching and listening
Excellent. <laughs> Mission Log Live is produced by Roddenberry Entertainment, executive producer Rod Roddenberry, technical production on Mission Log Live by Infinity Networks, producer Brendan Bradley. Uh, be sure to visit podcast.roddenberry.com for the latest from the Roddenberry Podcast Network, including not just Mission Log Live, not just Mission Log, but also Women at Warp, Priority One, and the Trek Files. Thanks to everybody who joined us live. Thanks to everybody who's joining us later. And we will talk to you next week. <laughs>